I also make oxymels with it or syrups, throat sprays, all kind of for the same thing. So for like sore throats, it's really wonderful for that, like whether it just be scratchy throat or some kind of infection. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. Bee balm is such a fun and powerful plant, and I'm excited that Abby Artemisia is the first one to share this plant on the Herbs with Rosalie podcast. Abby has an obvious love of bee balm, and I love that she shared information not only from her personal experiences, but also from traditional acknowledged sources. She also shares about her calling to help people find good relationships with plants and their greater communities. For those of you who don't know Abby, she's a botanist, herbalist, and professional forager. She was raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, where she spent her free time climbing trees and creek wandering. This is where her love of nature began. Her love of plants had a diverse foundation from apprenticeships on organic farms on the West Coast and in the Midwest to a bachelor's degree in botany from Miami University and an apprenticeship in herbalism with herbalist Leslita Williams, along with owning and operating her own tea business. After visiting Pisgah National Forest, she fell in love with the biodiversity of the Southeast. Abby then founded the Wander School, the Wild Artemisia Nature Discovery, Empowerment, and Reconnection School. Through the school, Abby offers the Wildcrafted Herb School program, customizable workshops, and botanical property surveys. The Wander School became a nonprofit in 2020 to provide botanical education, herbs, and herbal medicine to underserved communities, and to practice acknowledgement and reciprocity for traditional ecological knowledge. Abby is also the author of the Herbal Handbook for Homesteaders and the Wild Forage Life Cookbook. She's also the host of the podcast, Wander, Forage, and Wildcraft. Well, welcome to the show, Abby. It's such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. It's kind of fun. Like I'm interview, I'm a podcast host interviewing a podcast host. So <laughs> yes, it's really cool. As we were saying beforehand, it's a little weird to be on the other side of the mic. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm nice. Well, I am so excited to talk about your chosen herb, but before they get there, I want to hear about what brought you on this fabulous plant path. Oh, yes. It's such a cool story. I love hearing people's paths and mine has so many different facets that weave into it. And I always tell people because like, I don't know if this happens to you, but people are always like, how the heck did you get into that? <laughs> you know? So I always tell people I was lucky enough to be an outdoor kid. You know, I was raised in the area era when it was normal to like run around outside. And I did that. And I was blessed enough to have trees and woods and a creek to run around in behind my house. And um, all those things. So I just explored outside. And um, that's how I first got interested in all these naturey things and probably not plants as much as just nature in general. Mm -hmm. um, and went to outdoor camps and like had this really cool thing in school called outdoor education, which I don't think they do anymore. <laughs> but that's where I hung out all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, then when I was an older teenager, I started working in health food stores. Um, I grew up actually in the Midwest in Cincinnati, Ohio, and spent um, most of my life there. So there's actually a lot of green space there. 
And um, then I wanted to get away from there. And so <laughs> then I went out west to, I think, sort of near you. I was out in Oregon. And um, I was in southwestern Oregon in a tiny little town of a thousand people next to a tiny town of a thousand people. And I was working on a farm. And so I started learning about growing plants. And there were a few herbs there. And then I was so lucky to meet some neighbors who were um, and are <laughs> native folks and still live in the same place. And they're what I call my family now. And um, I go back and visit them when I can. And they taught me about the more of the medicine of herbs, the physical medicine and the emotional and spiritual medicine. Um, then I ended up moving back to Ohio and I had my daughter and I feel like that was when I really hardcore committed to living a natural lifestyle with herbs. And as I say, my daughter became my guinea pig. <laughs> so, um, I tried things out on her. And then I wanted to do work that I could do and be able to stay home with her. And I tried a lot of things. And the thing that stuck was actually a tea company. And so I was making my own tea blends and selling them at the farmer's market. And I met my amazing teacher, Leslie Williams, and we both lived in Cincinnati at that time. And as she tells the story, I begged her to teach me until she finally gave in. And so she started teaching classes in her living room. And she was already, I would say, an elder herbalist at that point. But unfortunately, she moved away about six months later, but we've done distance education ever since. And I'm so grateful for her vast array of knowledge and willingness to teach. And um, then over many years, I got into many car accidents. And as the story is of many herbalists, used my own healing journey to learn about herbs. And as KP said in your um, interview, you know, the whole journey we all know of the wounded healer. And so I did that. I learned a lot about herbs, about surgery. And also a big part of my recovery was walking out in the woods a little bit further each day with my Peterson's field guide, because that was all I knew. And just teaching myself the plants because there was nobody else around who was teaching them. Mm -hmm. And so then serendipitously, I'd already been to four colleges and hadn't found the program I wanted, but it turned out somebody, a parent of a child in my daughter's class went to Miami University, which strangely enough is in Ohio, and it's named after the Miami Indian tribe. And so they had a botany program. And... I didn't even really know what that was at the time, but I decided to go. And my first class was with um, my professor who would become my mentor. And it was Feel Bonnie. And I fell in love. And I was like, this is it. This is where I'm supposed to be. But um, I quickly learned that botany was a great foundation for learning the plants, but it didn't really teach anything about what to do with the plants once you knew what they were. So I actually ended up assistant teaching that course for the next three semesters and teaching the students who were mesmerized like what you do with those plants. So I also did a project there with the Shawnee and learned a fair amount from them about the plants that grow locally. Um, I did a fellowship at the Lloyd Library, which I feel like is this hidden gem that is in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, the largest botanical medicine library in the hemisphere. So if y'all don't know about it, go to Cincinnati. <laughs> um, and then I eventually ended up moving to North Carolina. And that was about eight years ago. And just happened to actually, you would love this at a fire cider in bulk party <laughs> nice. met my friend Tyson, who is an amazing Cherokee person. And um, we became really good friends. And I started spending time in Cherokee, North Carolina with the Cherokee people. 
and met a woman, Amy Walker, who ended up adopting me as my granny. Mm-hmm. And so I've been learning from the Cherokee since then. So yeah, I think I think that's the majority of the the long winding road. Oh, that was lovely. That filled in some holes for me that I didn't know. So yeah. 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 It's kind of interesting that life kept bringing you back to Ohio too. That's <laughs> just kind of fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interestingly, um, my daughter is about to go to college in Ohio. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I like that botany was such a big part for you too. I also had a start in botany, and um, I'm so grateful to have that. You know, as a background, mm-hmm. learning the plants because it's something I rely on, even though like hardcore botany is not really my calling. Like I'm just not that specific of a person. <laughs> so it's, it's not my thing. But. Yeah. We'll talk about it in a little while, but you know, that was, it was a hard thing for me because I went to all these different colleges and couldn't find a program I liked. I knew I wanted to study plants, but I couldn't find the program. And I went to Oregon state university for a little while and was in forestry. And it was like totally split down the middle between people wanting to study natural resources and people wanting to be loggers. So that wasn't neither of those things were what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So I'm so grateful I found the path that I did. Yeah. Well, I was literally jumping up and down for joy when I saw that you're choosing bee balm. So excited because this is such a fun plant. Like that's just the way I think of it. Like it's just super fun, also powerful, but I'll, I'll let you. How about you tell us why you chose bee balm? <laughs> Instead of just my excitement and you choosing people. <laughs> yeah, I think it's super fun too. Like when you just look at the shape and the color of the flower, when we talk about the red bee balm, um, you know, I I was looking through several resources before this interview, seeing what other people said. And Jim Duke, who I had the huge honor of meeting and teaching at his place, um, in the year before he passed, he says in um, one of his books, talks about them being fireworks. And it's kind of hilarious because he's like, yeah, on July 4th, instead of going to see the fireworks, I just decided to pull my chair out to my garden because I had three different varieties of bee balm in red, white, and blue. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) <laughs> so, so they are kind of like fireworks, right? And um, I chose it because one, I think it's so incredibly versatile. I love plants that are medicinal herbs and food as well. And this one is definitely that. And it just has such a wide array of benefits. Um, it's really important to me and it's also super important to some of the tribes that I work with. So I thought that was a really great thing as well. And, um, do you want me to just jump right in? Yeah, jump in. Let's go for it. <laughs> Cause there's so much to say. There is, yeah. Um, so it's native to much of the U S interestingly, what I found was much of the central and eastern U.S., but also the West Coast. So, hmm. <laughs> uh, it's also perennial. And there, I feel like, is a lot of confusion about this species because um, the species that I'm talking about, the Latin name is Monarda didyma. And that is the red flowered species. So some people call the like light kind of lavender colored flowered species, Monarda fistulosa, they'll call that bee balm. I call that one wild bergamot. But I have found in most of my research that they're generally interchangeable as far as herbal benefits and food. I feel like the taste is slightly different, but a lot of the same property is both really high in thymol, which I think is crazy cool that it actually has more thymol than thyme. Mm. <laughs> so thymol is this very strong antimicrobial. 
And to me, that's what you're tasting when you taste bee balm. And so when I say antimicrobial, it is antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal. It's also called Oswego tea because it's important to the Oswego tribe. It is sometimes called wild oregano because it's delicious. I feel like it's more delicious than oregano. It's also, I think, a little bit stronger. And um, I learned from Linda Black Elk, who I do some work with, that, and I don't know if I'm saying this correctly because I've only seen it written and I was trying to get in touch with her before this, but we didn't have time, um, that the Lakota word for it is wastemina. And I just talked to one of my Cherokee friends today and I'm just now learning the Cherokee syllabary, which is the Cherokee language. So I'm probably not gonna say this correctly. It's a very hard language to learn, but it is Walelu Unitsa Gisti. Mm. And I so love learning the Cherokee names for plants because each name has its own meaning. And so the beginning of that Walelu means hummingbird. Mm. And the rest of it, Unitsa Gisti, means they eat it. <laughs> so what my friend was telling me is for the Cherokee, it's all about right relationship. And so it's about the relationship that the plant has with the animal world. And oftentimes when you see bee balm, like I read some differing things about it. Um, in several places I read that it was pollinated by bees, but then I also read that the tubes of the flower are, the flower petal are too deep for the bee to get its proboscis into. So that it is um, pollinated by other things which can get into those longer tubes like hummingbirds. And amazingly, one of my favorite insects, the hummingbird hawk moth. Mm, yeah. I was actually at the Botanical Gardens in Asheville a week or two ago, just like watching this, so amazed as the hummingbird hawk moths just like circle around and get in there. And if you've never seen one, you should totally look it up because they're one of the craziest things I've ever seen. They look like a hummingbird but they have a tail that looks kind of like a lobster, like a crawdad, <laughs> so, and their wings flap really quickly. So they're like this magical creature and um, they pollinate this really magical flower. So um, they're great for pollinators. They're in the mint family. And um, like other mints, I feel like they're great in the garden for one pollination and also maybe keeping away some of the pests that might eat the garden. And yeah, they, so they also have the benefits of the mints, right? So what we call carminatives in herbalism, great for the digestive system. And um, the Cherokee, some of the Cherokee research I found says that some really interesting benefits. So a diaphoretic for fevers helps you sweat out a fever. Um, and super interestingly, a sedative. And I don't ever think of bee balm that way because like when I first got into studying herbalism, I was into Ayurveda. And so I really think of energetics a lot. And to me, bee balm is really hot mm -hmm. and spicy. And so for something that's hot and spicy, I don't usually think of it as a sedative. So I tried it last night and I made a tea of just bee balm. And first I was like drinking it and I was like, whoa, that's so strong. <laughs> it's spicy. I never drink bee balm all by itself. Mm -hmm. So it was really strong, first of all, but it did. Like I noticed I slept really well and it really mm -hmm. seemed to calm me down. So yeah, it's pretty amazing. I just want to um, mention that one time I had a very strong solo bee balm tea and mm -hmm. that was when I, and I was, this is like many years ago and 
when kind of the beginning of my energetic herbal studies and I drank the tea and I like, I felt that heat, you know, just goes down the esophagus, hit my belly, radiated out. And I was like, oh, that's diffusive. You know, it's like, you could read about diffusive all you want. But like, to me, I was just like, oh, that was like the first time I really got it. Cause that heat really did just like come out. Then it's so spicy. It cooled me down, you know, cause that like heat like, oh. radiated out, opened my capillaries. And I was like, oh, the stuff I've been reading about, you know, that can sound somewhat esoteric sometimes. It was just such a great felt sense of that. And so I'm very grateful to be balm for that, that experience. Yeah, that is really interesting. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, also because it's got all that time all and it's an antimicrobial, I like to not focus on just one phytochemical, right? Because one amazing thing that Jim Duke told me, he like, such a treasure. He like, let me ask him He's like, okay, three questions. You can ask me any three questions you want. <laughs> so somehow we ended up talking about phytochemicals and he was like, you know, I believe there are 10,000 phytochemicals in every plant and that in 10 years from now, we'll find there are 20,000 phytochemicals in every plant. <laughs> so just like the studies on um, St. John's wort, you know, where they just extract the hypericin and then they find out that it actually doesn't work as well for what we mostly think of it for, right? Antidepressant kind of qualities. Like, I feel like I don't want to focus on just the time all, but that is what it's really known for. And so for all of those antimicrobial qualities, it is great for colds and flus and um, fevers with that diaphoretic quality. And we can put it into all kinds of preparations. So great for a tea infusion, the flowers and the leaves, I throw the stems in there too. And um, for a tincture as well, I tincture all the aerial parts. And the, of course the flowers look really pretty in a tea blend. So you can give that to somebody that you love. And for steams, it's great for steams because you're inhaling all mm -hmm. those antimicrobial properties and because of the spiciness, I feel like it helps clear out your sinuses. It's an antiseptic wash. And interestingly, the Cherokee also talk about um, working with it topically a fair amount. So not just as an antiseptic, but actually like putting it on your head when you have a headache. Mm -hmm. And I love those kinds of things like reading that in the ethnobotanical research because I feel like it helps us as modern herbalists think outside that box of like, we just have to drink tea or take tincture. <laughs> so um, that was really cool. And um, also, I never thought about this, but it's so simple. It's called bee balm because people have worked with it to soothe bee stings. So <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so lots of wonderful, amazing things we can do with this plant. And I also make oxymels with it or syrups, um, throat sprays, all kind of for the same thing. So for like sore throats, it's really wonderful for that, like whether it just be scratchy throat or some kind of infection. And then I just like Hippocrates, right? Um, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. Um, I think whenever we can eat a plant, it's wonderful to be able to take it in that way. And this is one that's super tasty. So it's easy for us to do that. And um, I eat it in all kinds of ways. I just substitute it for oregano and I have it in a recipe in my cookbook, The Wild Forage Life, and I um, make a wild zatar, so the Mediterranean spice, and combine it with, I, I add that as like the wild oregano and combine it with wild sumac and nettles and a little bit of salt and oh. it's really yummy. So, but that's not the recipe I gave you. It's for wild oregano bee balm salt. Yeah, so, tell us about this wild oregano bee balm salt. <laughs> yeah, it's super duper easy. 
And um, so I think it's a great way for folks to start out who are just beginning foraging or growing it in their garden. Um, we could talk about growing it in a minute, but um, it's pretty easy to grow in the garden. And um, so I like to give new foragers or new herbal cooks really easy um, recipes. And so I make a lot of salts. I think wild condiments are awesome. I also have a wild spices course that I did. And um, so I always make my salts with fresh herbs because what, um, you know, if you want to get all scientific about it, salt is hydrophilic. So it pulls the water out of things. It's attracted to the water, the molecules in the salt. So I feel like it works better if you're working with fresh herbs because it will also, as it draws out that moisture, it'll also draw out the flavor from those herbs. So I pretty simply just throw the leaves into a clean coffee grinder or an herb grinder with the salt. And um, you can do it in batches if you're doing it in a small coffee grinder or just make a little bit at a time. And um, that's all you have to do. Just grind it, you know, maybe pulse it a few times and then let it sit in a jar. Really important to put a plastic lid on that jar or if you don't have one, a piece of parchment paper between your jar and your lid because the salt will eat through the metal really quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, you just let it sit there really like as little as a week, but you never have to strain it out. So you can just leave it in there forever and you're done and that's it. And I put it on everything um, like anywhere that you would want oregano and salt. So um, put it on eggs, put it on popcorn. I love it on wild mushrooms that I forage mm. or cultivated mushrooms. So it's just it's so delicious. And I have a hard time finding things not to put it on. <laughs> And so beautiful too, I might imagine. I've, yeah. uh, I make a lot of herbal salts too. And I love, you know, chives with the chive flowers. Mm. I love sage when it's flowering and to put the, um, oh, yeah. the purple sage flowers in there. But they are pretty like light lavender. And so I can mm. imagine with the red bee balm, that could be quite pretty. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't even put that in the recipe, I don't think. But you could totally throw in the flowers. If I did not put that in there. And it would be beautiful. Mm -hmm. um so i know there was something else i just said that i was gonna mention oh gardening yeah so, so what about gardening i grow three different varieties of bee ball myself. Uh, cool. i love that the cherokee name has hummingbird in it because i always associate hummingbirds with this plant because they're mm -hmm. always there and when i um tatiana who is a uh, watercolor illustrator who does a lot of watercolor illustrations for me whenever she does another bee balm I'm always like put a put a hummingbird on it because I just can't imagine it without yeah know. yeah I love that illustration she did so please tell her thank you so beautiful <laughs> yeah um so gardening uh there are different varieties you can grow um you can also grow the wild bergam bergamot the monarda fistulosa there is lots of different species of Monarda that folks can grow and lots of different cultivars. Um, I usually see, when I see it in the wild, I usually see bee balm growing in partial shade. And um, you, so you can grow it in partial shade or you can grow it in full sun. And um, I was looking at Strictly Medicinal Seeds website today, one, because I love Richo and he's a friend of mine. And I just think all everything they do is great. And they have amazing growing instructions, which are really helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were saying to grow the plants two feet apart from each other. And I had seen one foot apart on other sites, but I think one to two feet apart is a really good idea because they usually get powdery mildew, which is a fungus. And so if you grow them one to two feet apart, it will help prevent powdery mildew. And interestingly, I don't know if this is true, but I also read if you 
counterintuitively spray them with water, it will help prevent powdery mildew. So I don't know the science. I don't know about that. I don't know about that because it grew in my garden like and every year it got powdery mildew. And once we switched to not having overhead watering, I oh. haven't had that problem. And I kind of thought that was the problem too, um, but couldn't don't do anything do about it. Yeah. So that, that's just my experience. I'm kind of like, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, I feel like they're pretty forgiving as far as like where they will grow and what they will grow in. Mm -hmm. So partial shade to full sun. Um, but again, I usually see them in the wild impartial shade and the wild bergamot, the Monarda fistulosa in full sun. So I think they will both grow a little bit in either habitat. But um, yeah, I thought it was really interesting because I made, this was actually one of the first flower essences I ever made. And my friend, um, Julia Anihe, who's an incredible herbalist, who was from Florida and recently moved up here. But um, she taught the class and she was talking about sitting with the plant and while you're making your essence or beforehand and asking it for a message. And so I did that. I'm not gonna tell y'all totally what the message was, but a big part of it was about community. And um, every I've been taking it like leading up to this interview and um because I was listening to one of your your interview with Mason and he was like I drank OT every day for a month and I was like wow that's a commitment that was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have been taking the flower essence and it's flower essences if folks have not worked with them it's like to me, you know, it's so easy to think like, oh, they don't do anything. There's like no real trace of this flower in this essence, but I feel like they can have really strong effects. But like you also, it's good to be in this receiving mode where you're like really ready to deal with that thing and have that intention. And so some things have really come up for me in the last month around community. And I thought about like, I guess the doctrine of signatures of the plant. So the plant always grows in community. Like when I see it in the wild, I never see it growing alone. And then I thought about the fact that it's recommended to grow them one to two feet apart so that they don't get powdery mildew. And I was like, oh, so they grow in community, but they need personal space. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So good lesson. <laughs> especially during COVID times <laughs> um, when we're all a little weird from <laughs> being isolated for too long. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just an awesome plant and a native plant. And I, I just love it so deeply. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's um, speaking of like different species, this um, spring I bought um, Monarda didima. I always say didima. So but I'm sure they're both right. Monarda didima um, at the nursery and I was wanting the red flower and it came up pink and I already had pink. So I'm still, I'll have to get it from Richo because they are the best over there. And the, the, you're right, their descriptions on how to grow something. That's pretty much how I learned how to garden. <laughs> it's just Richo's. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And whoever else writes for him. So I have a lot of pink now. I definitely have the purple because that's what is closer. It doesn't grow necessarily in my valley, but it is more native to where I live. And then I'm also growing um, Monarda punctata, the spotted ah, eagle, which is just so cool. Um, kind of eat so long. It's not like big and bushy the way the other ones are, but I just love having it around. It's such a cool flower. It really is. It's so gorgeous with the yellow and the purple. The first time I saw it, I was just like in shock. Like I couldn't <laughs> move. <laughs> it's like, what is that? And it doesn't grow wild here. Um, I think my friend said it grows where she is in Charleston, but um, the first time I saw it was in Maryland and on a beach. I was like, what? Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's so aromatic. And I just like took some and put it on the dashboard of my car and could just smell it the whole way home. And mm. 
And yeah, it is, you know, I was thinking about like these names of plants, right? Especially talking to my Cherokee friend this morning and um, about right relationship and the names of the plants. And like, <laughs> I was looking at my Materia Medica for this plant, which I made years ago. And like, it literally said, I have a little place. Um, I made a form in my Materia Medica. And in that template, it says translation of the Latin. And I wrote in there, Monarda, named after some dead white dude. <laughs> so, I was like, you know, I just like, I think about that more and more because I'm creating this botany course and like trying to think about why it's important that we know botany. And it's often because we, it tells us about the plant right? It tells us like, which interestingly, this is Monarda didyma. And so the didyma part is to flower. And I'm like trying to figure out, like, I've just been thinking about that all day. Like, what does that mean? Because there's like usually one plant, one flower on each plant. So what is it about? And then my my Cherokee friend was actually like, yeah, Didemus, I think, is like a name out of the Bible. Like, whoa. <laughs> so, um, so it's really interesting to think about where can those things help us? Where are they not helpful? And can we rename things? Mm -hmm. I love using mnemonic devices. Um, just whatever helps me remember about the plant. So yeah thinking about those things mm, yeah those are all good thoughts mm -hmm. well abby thank you so much for sharing so much in-depth information about bee balm if people didn't already have their notebooks out in the beginning i'm sure they grabbed them pretty quickly because that was like just a major mm -hmm. uh, amount of information on so many different levels too i love the names mm -hmm. i love working with it i love the practicality and also your love for bee balm just really shines through thank you I'd love to hear what projects you're working on these days in the herbal world. Yeah, thank you for asking so much all the time. <laughs> um, so I really, I like had one of those middle of the night epiphanies several months ago. And um, I was actually about to start this uh, herbal herb school course that I'm offering called Wildcrafted Herb School. And I was like, oh my gosh, my mission is decolonizing herbalism. And I think like to my partner, he's kind of like, duh, like you didn't know that already. <laughs> it's like everything you do and talk about all the time. <laughs> but um, it just really clarified for me what I feel like I'm here for and what I've been really getting excited about the past couple of years. Um, especially since I have become interested in learning about Cherokee and other tribal herbalism. And um, I, you know, there's this great article I can send you called, I think it's called Water womb land cosmologic by this amazing herbalist patricia gonzalez who is um a native herbalist and i think varying backgrounds but um one tribe in the southwest and then also mexico and she's also a professor in arizona and it's a really wonderful article that they just made open source thankfully and actually, um, my friend read it when I took my class out to Cherokee a uh, year or two ago. And um, she talks about acknowledgement and reciprocity for traditional ecological knowledge. And it's something that's been on my mind a lot. And to the point where I'm going to, um, it was really cool. I actually had met her and didn't realize it at first. Um, she was the keynote speaker at the American Herbalist Guild conference in Oregon in 2017. And I ended up driving her to the airport and we like were chatting and she was like, contact me anytime. So um, I'm going to interview her for my podcast. But 
um, I've just been thinking about that ever since and teaching about it. And um, whenever I, which I should have said this at the very beginning, whenever I teach, I like to give a land acknowledgement. And so right now I'm on the traditional homeland of the Cherokee and the Catawba and potentially other tribes as well. And I just encourage people to think about the fact that if we're living in the United States, we are most likely on stolen land. And that's where we're harvesting our herbs from and growing our herbs. And where does our knowledge come from as herbalists? I think, um, well, this is more of question number four. So maybe I won't totally get into that yet. But, um, but yeah, it's it's become a lot of the work I do. And so in 2020, um, my business, The Wander School, became a nonprofit because it was the beginning of the pandemic. And I started seeing people like Linda Black Elk posting things like, hey, our Lakota elders really need herbs, but they don't want to leave their houses um, because they don't want to get exposed. And so we're creating these bins that we're hand delivering to them. And um, so we need herbs for that. And then all these herbalists, like lots of amateur, just beginning herbalists were like, hey, we really want to contribute and help out, but we don't know how to get herbs to where they need to go. And it was also um, Black Lives Matter was um, just, you know, starting then the protests were just starting. And um, there were people on the front lines of those protests who needed herbs. And so people wanted to donate, but they didn't know how to get them there. So I was like, okay, this is something I can do. And I have connections with these tribes and I know how to get things to people. And I just have a stupid big apothecary. And it's like, these medicines are just sitting there because when I, I have this like bad habit where it's like hoarding. And when I see medicine, I like can't walk past it. So <laughs> I harvest it. Um, and so we um, do a lot of work in Cherokee and um, my granny there, Amy Walker, she actually had an apothecary donated to her by her friend who passed, who was a good friend of hers and of the tribe. And it was just sitting in her storage shed. And so we moved that all to my friend's house in um, the Cherokee on the reservation. And um, we, so I take groups there and volunteers and students and we work in the apothecary and um, people donate herbs and money and that's always a thing. So folks want to donate, you know, and um, we make medicine, we process medicine because they harvest a lot of their medicine. And luckily, because some of the Cherokee never left that land, they still have a fair amount of traditional knowledge. And so we go there, we harvest, we process, we bring things, um, and we package things to be distributed to lots of folks for free in the tribe. So um, we're doing that. I send things to Linda Blood Elk and, um, other Lakota folks and um, work with the Gullah. So the descendants of the first freed um, colony of the descendants of enslaved people in South Carolina and um, potential to work with the Shawnee that I used to work with when I was in college. And um, we are about to send some packages to Uvalde. So it's really exciting. and. I love that, that work. It's super fulfilling. So um, that's happening. And that's a big part of the decolonizing herbalism work. Um, and I about that term real quick, Abby, because I feel like I don't, that's a term that I feel like people who use it know it, but people who haven't <laughs> heard it, you know, it could be even kind of prickly for some people. So exactly. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And um, I'm actually in the process of writing a blog about it because I don't think that it's well known or well understood. And um, because I've had some difficult experiences taking folks who have never engaged with indigenous people out to the reservation, um, 
I wanted to create something about with tips of how to engage and how to practice what at first I was calling reciprocity and now I'm calling reparations. And so um, I, so this is going to answer your last question, but um, yeah, I don't, I think that in herbalism, a lot of what we as herbalists don't think about is where the knowledge that we have comes from. And a lot of it comes from indigenous people and the descendants of enslaved people. And um, it was stolen. And it's, you know, acknowledgement is really important. Like there's a fine line between acknowledgement and appropriation, I feel like. It's always important to acknowledge where we got the knowledge that we have. But unfortunately, a lot of us don't know where it came from. Um, most of my teachers didn't know and didn't tell me where it came from because they didn't know. So what can we do, like, especially if you're teaching and making money from it, what can we do to give back? And I think it goes beyond um, reciprocity to reparations, really. And um, when I was talking to my Cherokee friend this morning, he was like, that's also part of being in right relationship. So we as people should be in right relationship with the plants and the land. And that to me means how can we give back? And so um, decolonizing herbalism to me means acknowledging where the knowledge we uh, have comes from, if we know, um, and giving back if we're making money from it. And if we're making medicine, giving some away, um, doing things like pop-up clinics, which I'm hoping to start in Cherokee, and um, land back for sure. So if you have a lot of land or even a little bit of land, how can you give that back to tribal folks? Um, if you don't know how to do that, you want to find out, you can email me and I'm happy to talk to you about it. Or And or how can you grow herbs on that land? that can be donated. So um, those are just a few things. Um, and also to, to learn your own heritage and what are the herbs of your people? How can you work with those herbs? Because they're still in your DNA. And also how can you work with invasive plants? Because those are not threatened and you can harvest them wildly and it doesn't threaten any native plants, you know, um, I, <laughs> I actually got in a like little, <sighs> little Instagram squabble <laughs> with someone um, about white sage because they made this reel about white sage and it was like very beautiful of them smudging their house. And I was like, Hey, um, you have a very large following. Could you maybe, um, tell your followers like, hey, um, white sage is actually somewhat endangered because it's been way over harvested and there's not enough for the folks who that is their tradition um, and they work with it in ritual, there's not enough for them. And there's a lot of other herbs we can burn. And so what are those herbs from our own heritage? It might be yarrow. Um, it might be mugwort and artemisia. Um, it might be pine um, and things like that. There's lots and lots of options. We can grow all kinds of sages in our garden that we can burn and lavender and, and lots of other things. So um, I, she uh, got mad at me and blocked me. <laughs> then I asked like, the black elk to write her and then she got mad at her and blocked her. And I just think it's a shame, you know, like, you know, we're public figures. Like, I feel like we have a responsibility to use our voice, to do what is appropriate and um, honor traditional people and amplify the voices of BIPOC people. So I think that's another way to decolonize herbalism. Like, I'm just starting to see this happen. So every conference I go to and teach at, I 
try to talk to the organizers about how can you include BIPOC teachers? And like, if that means me not teaching, fine. Like, I'm okay with that. But it it needs to be done. So how can we use our voice to amplify the voices of others? How can we give back? And how can we reroute money too? Like, that's another way to practice decolonization. Um, you know, there's, it's like weird for me because I have this book called The Herbal Handbook for Homesteaders. And um, I was actually asked by the publisher to, oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was asked by the publisher to write that book, actually. And so the title was not my choice. And like mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, I found out that homesteading is this like, very controversial word, um, which can sometimes be considered racist because of the Homesteading Act, which gave land, chunks of land to people, almost completely all white people. And it is their descendants today who still own large chunks of land. And it's been passed down generation through generation and BIPOC folks did not benefit from that. So, um, yeah, how can we, how how can we give back? And so I think it is a very tricky subject. It's very triggering for a lot of people. And one thing I say is like, please don't ever ask BIPOC people to explain this to you. This is the work that white folks need to do for themselves. And so do your research. I one of my favorite authors right now is Resma Menicum. And the work that he does, he wrote My Grandmother's Hands and this fabulous book I just got called The Quaking of America. And it talks about somatic abolitionism and how racism is in our DNA because of intergenerational trauma. And so we need to work with our own racism before we can work with anybody else's racism before. And this is like such a tricky thing for me because when I bring folks out to the reservation, I feel responsible for them. And sometimes it's really hard for me when people act out of ignorance to know how to interact with that. So I have to stop. And right now, the best thing I can do is do my own work with my own trauma um, before I try and address other people's trauma. But um, I guess I just want to say to folks like, the most important things are to take the step, to start the work, to start thinking about it and do your best to do no harm. And the most important thing I think that I say to people, which will be in this blog article that I'm writing about decolonizing herbalism is when you're interacting with indigenous people, the best thing you can do is listen. Mm -hmm. Don't ask why. <laughs> Because like usually why they oftentimes, why they do things is because that is their tradition. You know, they don't know why necessarily. It's just the way things are done there. And it's not our place to ask why. It's our place to listen and to learn because oftentimes if you listen long enough and well enough, you'll, you'll hear the answer. Um, and it's an amazing honor to be able to learn from indigenous people. So, yeah, listen and be grateful. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. And yeah, my takeaways are the listening, which is, I think, so incredibly important. Um, whoever is involved, whether it's humans or plants or the whole ecology, listening is mm -hmm. so important. And and I really, you know, thinking about being in a right or good relationship with all that came before us, all that is now, and, and really thinking mm -hmm. how can we continue to be um, stewards and tender, you know, tending uh, this world around us and, and building community as well. So thank you so much for, for sharing all of that and answering uh, as you did the, the last question, which is a reminder for folks who don't know, I asked the same question on uh, every season, each season. And for season five, it's in what ways do you think herbalism is misunderstood by the general public? So I appreciate your answer to that too, Abby. Oh, you're so welcome. I appreciate that question. It's a great question. And and I think um, the other point that I would add to that, just looking through my notes, is um, talk about Indigenous people and Indigenous knowledge in the present tense. 
I think it's a really easy mistake to make, but um, the indigenous people are still here and they're still doing these things. They're still working with these plants and still have this knowledge and they're still here. So I, um, people, some people actually don't know that there are still a fair amount. I mean, unfortunately, a much, much, much lower amount than there used to be, but there are still indigenous people here. So please use um, the current tense when talking about indigenous folks. Thank you for that as well. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Abby, for sharing about bee balm and community and relationship and your work with indigenous tribes. Uh, it's really important to hear all that you had to say. So thank you so much for being here and for sharing all of that. Oh, you're so welcome. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Rosalie, for for doing all the good work that you do to get the knowledge of herbs out into the world. It's it's really necessary. Mm, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Abby's wild oregano salt recipe card. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can find Abby at thewanderschool.com. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click on the subscribe button so you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this lovely spice. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.